Yeah, why don't we do that? I can go on the edge. Thank you so much. I always have a great screen to have done that. Yeah, we're sad. This is quite just I'm the one who's just welcoming you. I'm so happy to do that. I'm supposed to get behind this camera here. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My name is Carol Minkiti, and my husband was Ifani Minkiti. And I want to, the, our family, my children, my four children, and I have pledged to continue this story. And I want to welcome you. We're so happy to see you. And this is going to be a very special reading with Lloyd and Tara. And I know you'll be happy that you've come tonight, and I'm happy to see you here. And um, I know this. Ifani in his spirit is welcoming you here. He loved this place. So he would be happy to see you too. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Ifani. Um, the last time Tara and I read together was here. And this is really um, a lovely reunion. And uh, uh, we haven't seen each other in person in a while because Tara lives in Bucharest, Romania. Uh, but I was um, blessed to have Tara as a student um, a few years ago. <laughs> and I thought she was um, a brilliant young poet. Now she's just a brilliant poet. <laughs> pretty, still pretty young, though. Still young enough. Um, uh, she, um, one of my great disappointments was that she was going to come to, going to stay at UMass Boston uh, and take a, uh, do her MFA at UMass Boston, but she got an offer from BU that she couldn't refuse and shouldn't have refused because among other things, it gave her a Robert Pinsky traveling fellowship which she chose to go to see what her Romanian ancestry was going to be like. And uh, then she got a Fulbright to stay in Romania. And then she got another Fulbright. <laughs> uh, and she is there now as a poet and a writing coach, an international writing coach. Um, she is the founder of the International Poetry Circle, which you can uh, find online. And the, she is on the steering committee of a, an extremely important organization these days, the Writers for Democratic Action. And I encourage everyone to look into that if you, whether you're a writer or not, but if you're for democratic action, uh, this, is a, this is a good place to look. Tara is the author of The Amoeba Game and the forthcoming, I can't wait to see it, uh, Faith Farm. And um, we're going to do something tonight to repeat what we did the last time we read here together, which is that I'm gonna read a poem of hers and then she's gonna read and then she's gonna read a poem of mine. Uh, this is Morning Love Poem by Tara Skirtu. Morning Love Poem. Dreamt last night I fed you unknowingly something you were allergic to and you were gone like that. 
you don't have even a single allergy, but still. The dream cracked. Cars nosedive off snowbanks into side streets. Sometimes dreams slip poison, make the living dead, then alive again, twirling in an unfamiliar room. It's hard to say, I need you enough. Today, I did. Walked into your morning shower, fully clothed. All the moments we stop ourselves just because we might feel embarrassed or impractical or get wet. Tara Skirtu. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. I haven't been home in three years. Yesterday morning, I was in Central Square and, oh, I, I can take my mask off because I'm a leader. <laughs> what a world. <laughs> Yesterday in Central Square, I overheard a woman. She approached a man and she, she said, I can't stand it. She was talking about Zoom <laughs> and she was going on and on. And, and, and in the end, she said, I don't want to do Zoom. I don't want to be on Zoom anymore. And I know some of you are here on Zoom and we're all Zoomed out. And I thank you for being here with us on Zoom. I'm so happy to be here with you guys and with Lloyd. I'm going to start with some new work and how to practice, it's been a while to be in person. Over drinks. This morning I was thinking about mint, I told the playwright. Could be a good first line of a poem, he said. I stirred my drink and asked how the premiere of his modernized Hungarian Romeo and Juliet went. Brutal. <laughs> Before it even began, the actors threw him to the foyer floor. It was staged, but no one knew. Nobody tried to help. Half the critics went home and trashed the play that night. But this means it works, I said. What is meaning but a sword aimed at flesh? Sometimes I hate it as I'd hate hell. I prefer purgatory. Who wouldn't want a little extra time on the way to becoming your best eternal self? Fresh mint came to mind in the shower. This summer at the shore of the Black Sea, one of my best friends told me she couldn't stand the smell of it for years. After her husband died in an accident, his decomposing body was on view in the dining room for three days. Maggots in his nostrils. Bags of ice weren't enough. She picked mint in the hot yard and laid bunches around the corpse. In Romanian, to rub mint is to do absolutely nothing. How selfish of us to want to outlive ourselves. How selfish am I to write down my life and expect others to relate? To think I ordered mint in my lemonade for years, muddled it with my straw, chewed whole leaves, and my friend never said a word. Thank God for good friends. <laughs> Best family. So I live in Romania and um, I, I went to two Romanian funerals. And before the first one, one of my friends called me up and said, Tara, just heads up, sometimes the funeral can be more traumatic than the death. <laughs> the first one was, the second one was not, this is the second one. <laughs> Penance. 
but it was I who held your arm as the three grave diggers hammered your father's narrow coffin shut. It was I who drank every pore of your mother's vishinata, sucked the liquored meat of each sour cherry from its pit, swallowed even the floating worms. But it was also I who disobeyed the two saggy-breasted, callous-handed babas and headscarves, who, after asking if I knew anyone at the funeral, scolded me in Romanian for placing 12 marvelous white roses on the grave and not in the village church where they'd live longer, be admired by the living. It was I who wiped the Vishinata vomit from your face, wiped it from your arms and hands with my hands in the back of the backyard before dark. Daily, I wipe everyone else's piss from public toilet seats. And daily, I let traitors kiss my cheeks in public. But tonight, in my sleep, I'm finally arriving in outer space. I'm in orbit with my husband, whom I'm leaving for no one. We're breathing air that's just air. And I want to go back to our speck on the sliver of earth out the window. But this is now, and I am here. So tonight, we're in space for years. And this may shorten my life, but what of you? When I was working on that poem, I was so stuck at the end. And then I had a dream that I was, I had that dream and I said that in the dream. And then I had the poem. So I added this poem at the last minute for Aaron because Aaron is a big supporter of this poem. And we have to do a lot of things as kids that we don't necessarily want to do. One of the things was my mom was always teaching me, wanting to teach me how to shoot pool. Uh, she was going to biker bars. She would put 75 cents on the table. And for hours, she would beat every single man at the bar. And we'd be like, we want to go home. <laughs> and she finally taught me how to bank a shot as an adult. But what she really taught me how to do was write a poem. Um, and it's written kind of like a mirror, which is like banking the shot. Mirror method. My mother and I aim for the invisible spot. I've gotten this far. Two tables away, my mother becomes a mirror. A pool stick away. Aim here, she says. I haven't gotten that far in life yet. The cue ball lands. You're supposed to know where. All the best players know. All the best players know you're supposed to know where the cue ball lands. I haven't gotten that far in life yet. Aim here, she says. A pool stick away, my mother becomes a mirror. Two tables away, I've gotten this far and I aim for the invisible spot, my mother. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> oh, this is a fun one to read. It's one long sentence. I used to write on planes with old fountain pens. Now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Writing po the, the, the title of this confuses everyone in Romania because it's not a big baseball country. Writing poetry is like fielding ground balls. Someone is smoking in the lavatory and one of the flight attendants says, shit. And she gets on the mic and says, whoever this is will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law upon landing. And I'm writing, I hate ballpoint pens with a ballpoint pen because they don't spray my period brown ink all over the white designer jeans of the gorgeous Miami woman to my right which was how I learned not to write poems in a metal box in the sky with a 1930s Schaefer fountain pen. And I was the one waiting at the lavatory door when we all smelled the smoke and didn't know what to do, didn't know what to do. And I'd already been between two bombs at a bombing. So 
after being ordered back to my seat with a full bladder of wine, I order a whiskey. And this turns the Romanian flight attendant on, who winks and gives me nuts and olives on the house. And by now, I know again, we aren't about to explode this time and swallow my nip and eat my snacks and continue with this ballpoint pen I paint, working on what will 19 days short, two years from now, become a poem. And we land in Bucharest and everyone but me claps in perfect post-communist unison and the smoking man gets away with it. <laughs> This is the first of a companion series. Offering. It was the first time I'd lived with a man and I wanted him to translate the name of our street. He was holding my cold fist in his own and we were on Ofrande in the middle of unpaved Bragadiru, Romania on our way home. It's something you give to get something like a sacrifice like what you do for a god. I clawed at the cracked clay with bare hands, planted blood brown calories, daffodils, irises, pink peonies, white hyacinths. I transplanted a living wall of evergreens, lined the walk with lavender. I watered what I buried and waited. After the rains, Ofrande became a lake. I'd climb along the unknown neighbor's fence, his silent dog following me, pausing when I paused to estimate the depth of the mud, length of my jump, until one day I was there and she wasn't. And that was the fall I left offering street with some soil caked pots, my raincoat, patio set for two, in the front yard, under the hood of the gas grill, I left my keys. The man loved to grill, so I bought him one and rolled it into the garden I'd sown. Oh, virus time. I'm gonna read a really old poem that I wrote after getting better from a virus, sometimes it's hard to realize you're healed. Some days begin like this. The fear of forgetting I am well crawls into my mouth like a word that regrets being spoken. It presses sour phrases against my teeth, tongue, and gums. I want to tell it, stop, that I am well, that my blood is my blood, but as I'm ready to swallow, it wedges another phrase onto the back of my tongue. Something about the flawlessness of the antibody's memory, how it never forgets the image of the mother that abandoned it here. I read this poem one time to my friend's parent, uh, and he said, oh, did somebody abandon you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, this is the newest poem I've written. I had a really annoying neighbor. Didn't mean anything, but then it did. Leprechaun. The old woman next door would appear in our courtyard with a hand broom of sticks, dashing up and down the walkway, sweeping the rain each time it poured. Sometimes I'd look up from the kitchen table and there she was, waving at me as she ran up the stairs to our bedroom. She took everything she wanted, even a scraggly bush in our yard. One morning, I found it in her yard. Unbelievable 
how magical thinking kept me thinking I could garden the marriage until the man I married said that woman had her eye on the unknown fruit sapling I watered each week. And with shears, I snapped the thorny trunk in half. Mm -hmm. She didn't want it after I snapped it in half. It was mine. Mm -hmm. Offering Street. Every bush and bulb I planted in our small square plot, I pulled out that morning by the roots, walked each one by one to a pile of trash by the curb. The living wall of evergreens, budding lavender lining the walk to our door, the blood brown calories, daffodils, irises, pink peonies, white hyacinths, Everything I buried on Offering Street and watered. Everything possible to predict. All you said that was, that wasn't. What I didn't know and couldn't name, the wet gray clay released whoosh, into my grip. I never wanted to be a gardener. I wanted to garden. Mm -hmm. I had the last two sentences, which was one sentence kicking around in my head for like a year and a half, trying to figure out how to fit it in. So I'm gonna read just one more poem. I wrote it during isolation. It's the only kind of poem you can write during isolation and quarantine. It's a Turkish word, inshallah. We don't speak any more than a pocket full of words in the same language. But you know I'm a poet, so you bring me to a bar where typewriters hang from the ceiling and books cram the crevices. And next to you in the corner booth, I order two bullets meat and you gulp and wince because you've never had one. But tonight you want what I want and we want what we want to happen to happen. But you don't know what hopefully means. Mm -hmm. So we translate. Reverse translate on your phone what it means to be waiting on what we want. Religious discourse and if God allows. And now we're laughing at God willing us to talk about sex by not talking about sex. And we're far from our religions, but maybe not too far from sex. <laughs> And now I get to introduce pretty much my favorite person in the world. <laughs> but before I do that, I want to read one of his poems, which is a thing we do. And it's one of my favorite poems in the world. This is a true poem by Lloyd Schwartz, which is also in Who's on First, his brand new, new and selected that just came out with the University of Chicago Press. A true poem. I'm working on a poem that's so true, I can't show it to anyone. I could never show it to anyone because it says exactly what I think and what I think scares me. Sometimes it pleases me. Usually it brings misery. And this poem says exactly what I think, what I think of myself, what I think of my friends, what I think about my lover, exactly. Parts of it might please them. Some of it might scare them. Some of it might bring misery. And I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to hurt anybody. I want everyone to love me. Still, I keep working on it. Why? Why do I keep working on it? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever see it. I keep working on it. 
even though I can never show it to anybody. I keep working on it, even though someone might get hurt. So how to introduce Lloyd. I was baking one morning uh, and I had an advisory meeting with my new advisor. And this was the best thing that could have happened in the universe. Someone had switched my undergraduate advisorship to Lloyd. And the owner of the bakery was rolling out croissants and he said, Lloyd Schwartz is a famous writer. <laughs> <laughs> and I met Lloyd and in our first conversation, we really connected and we realized we both had Romanian roots in our ancestry. And anyway, Lloyd is, Lloyd is phenomenal. He's humble. He's an incredible poet. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning music critic. He's poet laureate of Somerville. Every month he has this wonderful engaging series called Let's Talk About a Poem that anyone can join. Um, he's a marvelous professor. I would not be where I am right now if it weren't for him. And I mean that with my whole body, um, my poems, my profession, everything. I love Lloyd so much. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Lloyd Schwartz with his new book, Who's on First, New and Selected, his life's work. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to read. <laughs> Tara, thank you. Thank you for that marvelous reading. Really, um, it just wonderful poems and beautifully read. And thank you for the introduction. It's really mutual. You know it is. Okay. Um, I'm, is that okay? Uh, I know um, some of you are here in the store tonight um, from some distance, uh, including <laughs> Romania and Salt Lake City and Connecticut and Watertown. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to start with a poem that is a kind of, that in its way is a sort of, not, at, at least an acknowledgement uh, of your uh, effort to be here tonight. It's called In Flight. And it begins with an epigraph from the importance of being earnest. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. <laughs> A big hefty guy next to me, an even bigger guy already squeezed into the window seat. Big pleasant fellows, strangers before this three hour nonstop domestic flight. But they've been talking away nonstop since before takeoff. Talking business, talking sports, China, India, my next seat neighbor might have been from India. Talking Cubs and Red Sox, they both love them both. <laughs> Google, the Euro, leverage, banks, bailouts, masters of money, it will change the way you think. <laughs> Great deals and missed opportunities. Exxon, fracking, megabus, Amtrak, breakdowns, lost luggage, and missed connections. A good place to stay in Detroit. Neither Cheez-Its nor Diet Cokes inhibit the juggernaut. So much experience, so many theories, so much friendly advice. The urgent need to tell each other everything they know before the flight is over the Indian fellow occasionally bumping my left arm in his enthusiasm. Exactly, absolutely. All they've learned and thought pouring out, pouring out, yet steering clear of delicate subjects, politics, 
they know better than that. Or home, an hour into the flight, my wife has become ex-wife. No names, nothing about <clears throat> movies or television, no mention of any other book, no music, but thoroughly tuned in to each other. Exactly, absolutely handing over and taking in whatever they can in 195 minutes, like old friends, except not. As we begin our rough descent, a startling silence fills the cabin. One of them has drifted into sleep. Stretching to look out the window, I can make out farmland, roads, then tractors and cars. Some bumps and the sleeper awakes, but the conversation is over. Shutting down, touching down, each of us left with our own thoughts of arrival or another departure. Then the busy powering up of phones, the clumsy lowering of overhead bags, jamming the aisle, eager to get off and on with our lives. No handshakes, no goodbyes, but separated in the crowd and each with a little wave, they call out, Sam, Andy. Um, this is another travel poem, kind of. Um, uh, had the good fortune to do some um, sort of research work in Brazil. Um, I, I went there because I was a kind of Elizabeth Bishop person and she lived there for many years. Uh, this is called Small Airport in Brazil. 9.31 in the departure lounge, nearly deserted. Monday night, everyone here is a little too tired to be traveling to another city. I search for an interesting face behind the newspapers and light on a young man, maybe 31, slim and well-dressed, that is, dressed with some thought. His tan jacket and pressed gray pants in muted harmony with a pale yellow shirt open at the collar. No tie, though there may have been one earlier. They fit him elegantly, suit him, suit his thin sandy hair and pale fair skin. His rimless glasses suggest seriousness, not fashion a tone confirmed by the forward gaze behind them, through them. He wears a touchingly simple gold band on his finger, another example of natural elegance. His wife must share his taste. Is he on his way to her? Is she picking him up at another small airport? Will they embrace warmly gracefully when he arrives? Or will she be up waiting for him at home, dinner on the table, or not, already asleep when he finally gets in after her own long day? Or is he on his way to yet another hotel after a week of hotels, tired of hotels, while his attractive, witty, attentive wife with her eloquent cheekbones and slightly sunken cheeks, begins to show her own weariness of spending so many nights alone. They'll cost something these nights. Everything costs something when you have to make your way through the world, even if you're not new to the idea or just beginning not to be new to it. And one more um, Brazilian 
<laughs> reference. Uh, this is a little tiny poem called Renato's Dream, Brazil, 1991. Such a sweet dream. I dreamed I was having a conversation with the great poets, Manuel Bandera and Carlos Drummond de Andrade. I was born tired, hungry, and cold, I said. And Drummond answered, I too. <laughs> um, it's really kind of amazing to have a collection of your poems. It's amazing anyway to have a collection, but something that also includes so much of your earlier work. And uh, this is the title poem, and it's the first poem in the book. It's a dialogue or series of short dialogues. Who's on first? You can be so inconsiderate. You are too sensitive. Then why don't you take my feelings into consideration? If you weren't so sensitive, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> you seem to care about me only when you want me to do something for you. You do too much for people. I thought you were going home because you were too tired to go with me to a bar. I was, but Norman didn't want to come here alone. I'm awfully tired. Do you mind taking the subway home? Silence. You could stay over. Silence. <laughs> I'll take you home. Silence. <laughs> Why do we have sex only when you want to? Because you want to have sex all the time. Relationships work when two people equally desire to give to each other. Relationships rarely work. <laughs> Do you love me? Of course, but I resent it. <laughs> Why aren't you more affectionate? I am. <laughs> Couldn't we ever speak to each other without irony? Sure. I love you, you know. Yes, but why? Do you resent my advice? Yes, especially because you're usually right. <laughs> why do you like these paintings? What isn't there is more important than what is. Your taste sometimes seems strange to me. I'm a Philistine. A real Philistine would never admit it. <laughs> I suppose you're right. <laughs> Aren't you interested in what I care about? Yes, but not now. We should be more we should be more open with each other. Yes. Shall we talk things over? What is there to say? Are you ever going to cut down on your smoking? It's all right. I don't inhale. Sometimes I get very annoyed with you. The world is annoying. Your cynicism is too easy. Words interfere with the expression of complex realities. Do you enjoy suffering? You can't work if you don't suffer. But we suffer anyway. I know. Do you think we ever learn anything? I've learned to do without. You're always so negative. I feel death all the time. Are you afraid of anything? Not working. What should we do for dinner? It doesn't matter. Whatever you'd like. Why don't you care more? I do.
Um, this is, uh, where is it? Uh, this is another love poem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for, for getting that job. <laughs> oh, okay. Crossword for David. You're doing a crossword. I'm working on a puzzle. Do you love me enough? What's the missing word? Do I love you enough? Where's the missing piece? Yesterday, I was cross with you. You weren't paying enough attention. You were cross with me. I wasn't paying enough attention. Our words crossed. Where are the missing pieces? What are the missing words? Yet last night, we fit together like words in a crossword, pieces of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, some years ago, a few years ago, uh, the Emily Dickinson House in Amherst was um, restoring uh, parts of the house, including uh, Emily Dickinson's bedroom. And um, a number of poets, Tara, I think you were one of them, uh, were invited to the house uh, to spend an hour in the, what was closed off to the public, uh, uh, Emily Dickinson's uh, bedroom. And with the idea that maybe a poem would come out of this. And you were really actually encouraged to write a poem there. Uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> but a year later, it was about a year later, um, it, you know, the poem the poem that I, I think I needed to write um, came to me. And um, it's a sonnet uh, called In Emily Dickinson's Bedroom. And um, one of the items that was in that room, in the bedroom, was a, um, a sort of um, photocopy of a draft of a poem that Emily Dickinson was working on. So it was just a photograph of, of um, a reproduction of her manuscript. And um, uh, I want to read you just the first stanza of this poem because my sonnet includes all of the words that are, uh, are, that are in this stanza. Um, and this, this, her stanza is a chilly piece infests the grass, the sun respectful lies. Not any trance of industry, these shadows scrutinize. If anyone can explain that to me, <laughs> I, I will be here afterwards. In Emily Dickinson's bedroom. A chilly light pervades the empty room, bringing neither its current nor former inhabitant peace. Rather, its immaterial lingering infests both the air inside and what we see of the grass outside, brittle, brown, as if it wanted to avoid the sun. Inside, the visitor must be respectful and polite, evasive without actually telling lies. Everything here seems hidden, is hidden, not just the bricked up chimney and plastered over doorway. Any clue under the wide floorboards behind the blocked entrance to the haunted chambers of a heart? Patches of verse 
of old wallpaper, the main street, not yet a street? What industry motivated those uncanny dashes, these shadows still eluding our meager efforts to scrutinize? And I am going to read three more poems. Um, uh, I've written a number of poems about my mother, especially in her advanced age and losing her memory. And um, they are all together again for the first time uh, in this book. And I'm gonna read one of them and it's another dialogue. Uh, he tells his mother what he's working on. I'm writing a poem about you. You are? What's it about? It's the story about your childhood, the horses in the river, the ones that nearly drowned. I saved them. You told it to me just a few weeks ago. I should dig up more of my memories. I wish you would. Like when I lived on the farm and one of the girls fell down the well? Yes. I forget if it was Rose or Pauline. It was a deep well. I remember that story. Have you finished your poem? I'm still working on it. You mean you're correcting it with commas and semicolons? Exactly. <laughs> when can I see it? As soon as it's finished. Is it an epic? It's not that long. No, I mean all my thoughts, the flashes of what's going through my life, the whole family history, living through the woe the river and the water. I know. Will it be published? <laughs> I have to finish it first. It's better to write about real life. That's more important than writing something fanciful. I try to write all my poems about real life. You see, the apple never falls far from the tree. I guess not. You're my apple. There's probably a worm crawling through that apple. <laughs> then it's got something sweet to chew on. Well, you are my tree. Yes, I'm your tree. You are an apple. I'm a tree. And um, I, I couldn't resist reading this poem because um, of the time of year we are in and I don't often get to read I don't always, always do a reading in October and this um, it's October uh, this is um, uh, it's a, a poem in three in, in the form of three sonnets and it's called leaves moving from a tree to <laughs> leaves one every october it becomes important no necessary to see the leaves turning to be surrounded by leaves turning it's not just the symbolism to confront in the death of the year your death one blazing farewell appearance, though the irony isn't lost on you that nature is most seductive when it's about to die. Flaunting the dazzle of its incipient exit, an ending that at least so far, the effects of human progress, pollution, acid rain, have not yet frightened you enough to make you believe is real, that is, you know this ending is a deception because of course nature is always renewing itself. 
The trees don't die. They just pretend. Go out in style and return in style, a new style. Two. Is it deliberate how far they make you go, especially if you live in the city, to get far enough away from home to see not just trees, but only trees? The boring highways, road signs, high speeds, 10 axle trucks passing you as if they were in an even greater hurry than you to look at leaves. <laughs> so you drive in terror for literal hours and it looks like rain or snow but it's probably just clouds, too cloudy to see any color. And you wonder, given the poverty of your memory, which road had the most color last year, but it doesn't matter since you're probably too late anyway, or too early. Whichever road you take will be the wrong one. And you've probably come all this way for nothing. <laughs> Three. You'll be driving along depressed when suddenly a cloud will move and the sun will muscle through and ignite the hills. It may not last, probably won't last, but for a moment, the whole world comes to, wakes up, proves it lives, it lives. Red, yellow, orange, brown, russet, ochre, vermilion, gold, flame and rust. Flame and rust, the permutations of burning. You're on fire. Your eyes are on fire. It won't last. You don't want it to last. You can't stand anymore. But you don't want it to stop. It's what you've come for. It's what you'll come back for. It won't stay with you, but you'll remember that it felt like nothing else you felt or something you felt that also didn't last. And I'll read one more poem. Um, uh, it's about uh, one of Titian's mythological paintings that is not in this, the great uh, Titian exhibit at the Gardner Museum right now, which if you can possibly get to, I absolutely encourage you to do that. But this is about a different painting and um, it's called Titian's Marcius. The 16th century Venetian master's very last painting, as big as life, is the story of the pan-piping satyr who dared to challenge a god. Titian painted his crucifixion. He hangs by his ankles from the branches of a tree, his goat legs askew as Apollo kneeling tenderly skins him alive. Upside down, his tormented expression reads like a smile. A thirsty pup is lapping up his blood. Seated close, wrapped, old King Midas with his golden coronet contemplates the horrific scene. It's the 90 year old artist's self portrait. Someone who's learned the cost of making art, the cost of challenging the gods and has accepted it. Except for the glittering crown, most of the surface is rougher, murkier than the master's earlier dazzle. Close inspection reveals paint smeared by his own fingers. He put his whole body into this painting. It was found in his studio after his death. After how many years could anything still have been left for him to do? A work is complete 
Rembrandt said, if in it, the master's intentions have been realized. Thank you very much. We're gonna open it up for a question and answer. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, 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 sure. <laughs> sure. We we can we can not answer our questions in, in full view. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably Zoom questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yes, um, yeah, Dan. Very much taken by the um, sadness and humor involved with your poems about your mother, you know, and about her uh, Alzheimer's. You know, but you managed to kind of lift the sorrow to the humor, I think. Well, my mother had a great sense of humor, and I hope um, some of that comes through. And 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 her, she was um, a really extraordinary person, and um, she's someone who, you know, taught me to laugh at things, and who also um, um, she loved music. Not not so much the kind of music that I got really involved with uh, writing about later, but um, but that was my that was my 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 introduction. We had a, a seventy eight RPM recording. I think it was the only classical recording in my mother's collection of recordings, and it was it was Tchaikovsky's March Slav. <laughs> And I think that was my very first piece of classical music. I still like it. You have a great sense of humor in your poems. That, Thank that you. runs <laughs> runs through your poems, surprise, full of surprises. And, and I I really love poetry that includes something to be amused by. Me too. It's like life's greatest coping mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you helped teach me that too. Oh. <laughs> any any other questions? Comments, Pete? Lloyd, uh, when was your first off date? Mm, I think the earliest poem in this book maybe from the mid 1970s when did you start writing poetry i wrote i started writing poetry when i was i kind of fell in love with poetry when i was a senior in high school and i'm not going to tell you when that was <laughs> it was it was earlier than the mid 70s um, and i i had a i had a great teacher who would do a great English teacher in my senior year of high school. And I wasn't really especially interested in English literature or poetry or anything like that. But my teacher would stop at nothing to make the students in that class interested in poetry. And I, I can still picture him leaping. I mean, he was not a young man, but leaping on top of his desk and holding out his hand and reciting, is this a dagger that I see before? <laughs> and um, he, uh, we read um, uh, Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn and Frost's Fire and Ice. And I thought, wow, this is really, this is marvelous. And, and that's when I, I, I started I started writing uh, then. I, I, I was I wouldn't say I was a particularly talented um, high school writer, but I got very serious about it. And my first poem was a, 
in the final poem. It's a comic poem because, well, I couldn't write anything like Frost or Keats, but I could I could tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, I wrote through all through, all through college. I was very serious about writing in, in, in college and all, all very too serious. Um, and then um, you know. so, so Tara, um, mm. I never heard anybody talk about how to play pool helped them write poetry. I wonder if, and it sounded like there was a story behind that poem that, that uh, seems just so um, close to the surface but beautifully reflected. Yeah. And, and uh, actually, and both of you have um, used games in your poem. I wonder if you could talk about a little bit about the role of games um, in art. Well, <laughs> a tall order. So that poem was a really tricky poem for me. You know, I, I mean, the most complicated relationships in our lives can be with our parents. Um, and, <laughs> you know, that poem, it has a, it, it could feel like it has a dig at the end. But also, it can feel like it, it really aims towards the self, and and um, you know, and it's it. And so my, I had no idea I was going to write that poem. I returned to Florida. My mom, I, I, I don't have a particularly amazing, deeply thoughtful time with my mother, and I thought maybe we can play pool. And it was the best time I had in my life, my whole adult life with my mom, and she was teaching me things again, and she got to teach me how to bank a shot, which I never wanted to learn as a teenager. And she said something at the time, um, because in my mind, she's a really great pool player, but she said, you're supposed to know where the cue ball lands. I haven't gotten that far in life yet. <laughs> and I wrote it down. <laughs> and I knew that I wanted, I thought it would be a tiny little poem, but also I wanted to write a poem that shows the complications of finding your, you know, your, your parents and yourself. And, and actually it's a really funny story. I wanted to write it for over a year. And then I got in the shower one day and I figured out, oh my God, I think I can write this like a mirror. And so it functions, mirror method is the name of that banking the eight shot. And to have the two stanzas mirror each other. And I got out of the shower and I, I this is like the only time this has ever happened. I didn't even get dressed. I just sat at the edge of my, my desk and I tried really hard to get all the words in place and I got stuck. And what helped me fix it was adding the, the my mother because then it aimed at her at the end. And I didn't know what I was doing the whole time I worked on that, but it was a game to try to make that form work. And once I figured out that I wanted to try to make that form work, I just played part by part, like shooting pool. Can you um, show us what it looks like on the page? Yeah. Oh, it's, I think it's under my... And too. another thing, because my, my book is called The Amoeba Game, <laughs> and that is also from, from Girl Scouts. We had to play, I was a really quiet kid. This is, I mean, it, you can't quite tell. I mean, it's, it's back to back. It's just, it just reverses itself. But in Girl Scouts, I was really quiet and I got really anxious about hanging out in groups. And one day we played this game called The Amoeba Game. And you didn't have to talk. <laughs> You just closed your eyes and you wandered around like this until you touched someone and then you stayed touched. And you did this until everyone became this blob. And there was something so calming about this, but it really makes me feel like how poetry is, you know, it's just going th through life. And also amoebas are, are these tiny insignificant things, but they also can kill you. <laughs> it's like life. So I don't know, games are really serious the way humor is really serious. Most amazing things happen to you in the shower. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I think to, to, to answer your question, I, I, I think I didn't know I was doing that, but I do think that writing and especially writing poetry has a very big element of the, the game about it. I mean, I think you, you could see it in, in of the poems that I read tonight, you could see it in the Emily Dickinson poem, which my game 
my sort of my not so secret secret is that I was trying to use I couldn't write the poem without using all of the words in that stanza that were in the Emily Dickinson poem that was in that room when I was there. And I was very glad I copied down that that poem. I didn't know why, but I just sort of wanted. And um, I think form in poetry and some of my poems are extremely formal and some of them are very are much looser in format but especially formal poetry is a kind of game. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, you know, it's, it, it's a serious game. It's a puzzle uh, game. Yeah, yeah. The crossword and puzzles, that's also another form of game. Yeah, no, I, that, 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 that's the one that, yeah. that, that, that came to mind. But I'm, I, I, I wasn't especially aware of, of, of that in, in, in my other poems, but I'm sure they are there. Um, well, yeah, for example, yeah. yeah. We've got one from the chat from uh, Ooh. Ooh, from Rexler. the internet. We did more of a oh. comment than a question, but Loy, your poems that are conversations are contrapuntal in a way that reminds me of music, the way voices and melodies overlap. How did this style slash genre arise in your work? Do you think it came from your love of music? Thank you both for a wonderful reading. Oh, thank you for the comment, comment question. Um, well, it, 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 it didn't happen intentionally. And um, uh, if, if, if it's true that that is a musical element in, in my poems, I, I really, I appreciate that and I appreciate anyone noticing that. Um, the whole idea of dialogue and and you know and and dramatic monologues um uh there was a a, a a a a big thing in my life that happened and i was i was actually um a very serious about acting and uh, I was also very serious about teaching and getting a PhD. And for a while, it looked like I could do both. And that was very satisfying. Um, then I lost my teaching job. And then I got another teaching, I got another off teaching job, or an offer of a teaching job which would involve my teaching at night. And I would have to teach at night if I took this teaching job. If I taught at night, I wasn't gonna be able to do any live acting on a stage because that took place mostly at night. And this was a really difficult decision. And I was, um, I was working with, um, some wonderful actors with a lot of wonderful actors and some of them became very famous and some of them didn't. And I, I, um, I was too scared to risk that. And I cared too much about teaching and being an academic and having an academic life. I mean, I really loved that. And I took the, jo the teaching job but it was partly out of fear of not being able to get work as an actor. And, um, and sometime after that, I was getting very bored with the poems that I was writing because they were mostly about myself and they were mostly kind of sappy and depressed. And I thought, I, 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 I have to write something more interesting than this. I mean, if I'm bored by this, imagine uh, uh, imagine what readers would think. And it just occurred to me that, well, there was something that I wanted to write about. There was a subject that I wanted to write about, it, about but I didn't want to write about it in my own voice. And I invented a character. And I love 
character poems, and it's a big part of English literature, Chaucer and Browning and Robert Frost and Elizabeth Bishop, uh, Robert Lowell and Frank Dart, poets that I truly and deeply admire. So I had, you know, I just wrote this poem and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And then I kept writing poems in the voices of other people, including dialogues, which came later than the, just the single voices. I think Who's on First is the first dialogue poem that I, that I, that I ever wrote. And uh, that kind of took over my writing life. And it, in some very weird way, which I, I can't quite explain, the poems that I write in the voices of, of other people seem more like me than the poems that I write in my own voice. Poems I write in my own voice sound like other people's poems, but the poems in in voices that are either made up or you know my, my in my mother's voice, they feel more like my poems than than the other. A uh, long answer to a <laughs> to a question that's really uh, very important to me. That's been a question that I ask myself. Thank you. Are we, are we all out of questions? We all have questions on the Zoom sphere. Mm -hmm. You guys? Peter. I want to say, boy, and you never knew that bad. You were just an actor. <laughs> That's what you can I played lots of Russians and, re <laughs> and reporters. <laughs> and I actually grew my beard in. 1968 for a part in a play because I didn't want to wear a phony beard. And you never cut it off. And I never <laughs> shaved it off. That's the real thing. Because that turned out that's that's what I thought I was supposed to do. <laughs> uh, neither of you know when to show a new poem or something. Ah. Uh. <laughs> well, he's the first person I show it to. Yeah. And I'm so lucky. And boy, that's it's hard. It's hard. I, I think for me, I will show my friends my poems when I can't figure out what else to do. And if I'm lucky, as as I have been, they will say, "Well, mm, this isn't working. Why don't you try this?" Or, you know change this and that will kind of open things up and then but once once i've already done that then it's easier to go back to the person who made the suggestion and say does this work any better so i'm not so in, intimidated i'm not so nervous about showing it to anyone but it's usually it's it's rarely oh i think this is the best thing i've ever written and i want all my friends to see it <laughs> it's usually does it work is it a does poem? it work is it, is a, it poem? a poem what can, what I, something is missing but i don't know what and and um, and i i have very i have, some of my friends are very good critics <laughs> What would you guys say in terms of the state of poetry? Today? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> no. no, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's alive as ever. Yeah, it's really amazing. Uh, and we need it. Right now, it, has it, or is it, is it. Have you seen a change in the last 10, 15 years? Are there more people doing it? Are there less people? There are. There, there are certainly lots of people doing it. Um, it is changing. Um, uh, the demographics are changing. Uh, there are, I think, there are more younger poets. Um, um, there are maybe fewer star 
poets, you know, kind of the really big names in poetry that I grew up with. I mean, I think there's no one now who is, who has the reputation uh, or the, 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 the following of an Elizabeth Bishop or a Robert Lowell. They were the, the two great figures when I was growing up. And I'm not sure there's anyone quite like that now. It's, so it, in some ways it's more compartmentalized. And then also what's happened, in, I mean, I took a poetry writing course when I was an undergraduate. Now there are MFA programs and Tara is the superb product of an MFA program. Derek is the product of an MFA program and PhD program in creative writing. So it's, it, things are, are changing, but things have always changed in poetry. Poetry is constantly evolving. It reminds me of a Jeffrey O'Brien quote. I am once again where I never was before. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And it's every time you start a poem. And that's, I mean, really, it's, it's, like it's like every day, and, so. and every time you start a poem, you have no idea where you're going. Every time you start to read a poem, you have no idea where you're going. We just know we, we need poetry. We really do. Yeah. It, I think about it all the time. Why is it so important? I can't answer it. That's how I know it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Hardest question in the universe. Thank you for that one. <laughs> Are you a poet? I'm a minor poet. I like to stick with that way a little bit. And I'm, oh. part of the reason why I'm here is to, I, I don't know your work. And this was, I came because of Tara and I know she's came back to the States recently on a big fan of hers. And I, this was a gift to hear, to hear you read and to hear you about. So. He is a gift. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's the best. So. He's the best. <laughs> well, with that, thank you, everybody, for attending. <laughs>
very, very Has a pretty uh, uh, active poetry society, and they do they do stuff on a regular basis. And we went last night a Rosemary. Uh, I can't remember her last name now. She's out in Colorado. Purple. Uh, yeah. And it's just I'm just trying to do a little bit of it each day. So I get to see a poem a poem a day. Her, her, the theme of the, of the night. Um, I'm just trying to do it a little bit as I can. And you guys, this is very inspiring. So, See you and it's just like a whole, whole circle thing for me. So I'm kind of, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of excited. <laughs> so, yeah. This is nice. Oh, but I love that you got into fountain pens yeah. too. Well, I wanted to decide because hopefully something from you will enter the pen and then come into the. <laughs> I'm just really just. I'm fanboying here a little bit. <laughs> why? Why apologize? <laughs> A, it's, it's a little uh, yeah. but I really you appreciate yourself. Do you want to take a picture? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sure. That, that would be awesome. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. 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 And in fact, I think this is the six foot part. Yeah. 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 That's complete, but it's right. 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 Wonderful. Thank you, Lord. I hope we can get together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Because uh, that's what they. Yes, superintendent. So we're we're hanging out. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Oh yeah. Wait. Oh wait. We got another one. Oh, oh we got our oh, very bright light. <laughs> Oh, no, the light is very. Tara, Tara, can you take a picture for us, please? Sure. Yeah. Look yeah. back there. Yeah. Or probably the light is better here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On three. One, two, three. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, no problem. Oh my God, thank you for telling me my Oh, I I I I I I